The program is about to begin. At this time, we ask that you turn off all cellular devices. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. For those I've not had a chance to meet, my name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Rama Bregan Presidential Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here. In honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. As I was preparing for the arrival of our special guest today, not that it has anything at all to do with them, but I ran into some depressing statistics. Don't worry. While this introduction will start on a low, I promise it will end on a high. The stats that I ran into were all about who was reading books these days and how often. Some of the numbers concern me. Now, don't hold me to them exactly as my source was the internet, but they are revealing, and if even close, they are tough to swallow. What they say, one third of high school graduates never read another book for the rest of their lives. 42% of college graduates never read another book after college. And 80% of US families did not buy or read a book last year. Now, I have to presume that to the extent these people read, their reading habits are confined to 140 character tweets, blogs, weblogs, chats, instant messages, emails, and an occasional traffic sign. <laughs> I think they're missing a lot. I say that because every once in a while, a team of truly talented writers will get together and write a gift, a gift for all of us, and a work that informs, educates, and entertains all at once. That is definitely the case with Nancy Gibbs and Mike Duffy's The President's Club. It really is a great book. We're here today at a presidential library, which happens to be the best, in my unbiased opinion. And while I'm handing out opinions, having read Nancy and Mike's book, I am sure there will not be a better book with such unique and interesting insights on the modern day presidency published for some time. Now, I know this because for me, the book passed the, I didn't know that test, on every page. I didn't know that President Clinton had real respect for President Nixon. I didn't know that there was a presidential clubhouse across from the White House where only former presidents are allowed to stay. And I definitely didn't know that it was President Reagan who taught President Clinton how to salute. These really interesting discoveries are just a handful of the scores of such revelations throughout their book. And no wonder, Nancy and Mike are two of the most talented writers and editors at Time Magazine who have the experience, the awards, the Rolodexes, and the reputations required to write such a wonderful book, 
So ladies and gentlemen, with that, please join me in welcoming Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy. Thank you. Thank you. Hang. We could stand, we but could we'll stand. sit. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that ridiculous introduction. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to start by saying that in the five years that Nancy and I spent putting this book together, we had many aha discovery moments where we were learning uh, as much about the presidents as you will learn if you get a chance to read this. Things we didn't know, things that surprised us, surprised us even about the men we had covered um, from Reagan through Bush and Clinton and Bush and now Obama. Um, so for us, it was a real journey of discovery to say nothing about what we learned about Hoover and Truman and Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon and Ford. So um, we too came away sort of thinking, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, and for us, it was a, a journey that continues because people keep telling us things we didn't know. But in some ways, uh, I, Ronald Reagan was a, a, a a, big, a bigger part of that story than we would have guessed because we first meet him in 1947, um, long before he's president. Uh, and as we dug deeper and deeper into Reagan's relationship with the club, we learned that he actually had seen FDR when he was living in Des Moines. And he'd gone to a, a Truman fundraiser in Kansas City when he was still a Democrat. Uh, and would then be taken under the wing of Ike uh, when he was beginning his political career as a Republican. Um, and I was struck by how his relationship with the club was so deep as we were coming up the driveway here and we saw over and over again all the presidents, which is a reminder that every person who served as commander in chief sees himself as part of a bigger club. I just want to advance the picture here if I can. This is a picture that was on the cover of Time uh, two or three weeks ago. It's a Brooks Craft picture. It had never been published before. Um, and so we were thrilled to put it on the cover because it takes you into the modern club that really began uh, a long time before George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Bill Clinton were there to pick up the torch. And in fact, it begins in what year would you say? Well, um, it begins when a president is in need of some serious help. And that is what it would take to bring together such an unlikely partnership as Harry Truman and Herbert Hoover. Two men with nothing in common politically, nothing in common personally, no relationship of any kind, except for the fact that the world was a very difficult, dangerous, challenging place in 1945 when Truman suddenly finds himself president. And so he is not one to stand on ceremony. He did not care that Herbert Hoover had left Washington as the most hated man in America with his motorcades being pelted with rotten fruit, had been exiled completely. Uh, and whenever anyone had suggested to Franklin Roosevelt that maybe you know, Hoover could be useful, and you know, Hoover knows a lot, and he, he was a great humanitarian relief worker before he became president, and you, know, you could use him, Roosevelt would say, I am not Jesus Christ. I am not raising Herbert Hoover from the dead. <laughs> Harry Truman felt differently. Harry Truman was reading the reports that said that as many as 100 million people in Europe were at risk of starving because the continent had been so devastated. And so knowing exactly how the Roosevelt White House would react to this, Truman secretly mails a letter, personally, he secretly mails a letter to Hoover saying, would, would you be willing to come in and talk to me? And the two men meet. This picture is taken in May of 1945. Truman's only been in office for a matter of weeks. And they're very suspicious of each other, and Hoover afterwards thinks nothing is going to come of this. Well, within a year, Hoover has been given a staff and a plane and sent by Truman uh, 55,000 miles around the world. He went to 22 countries. He met with 36 prime ministers and seven kings and the pope. And his mission was to move food from the countries that had it to the countries that needed it. And in doing so, these two presidents formed this partnership that was, existed so far outside of policy differences, of political differences, uh, because they both were so committed to what needed to be done. And that first laid the foundation, laid the sort of philosophical premise for what presidents, and sometimes only presidents, could do for one another. And this is why 
when the two men meet one another on the platform at Eisenhower's inauguration in 1953. Hoover goes over to greet, greet President Truman and says, I think we should form a president's club. Truman says, great, you be the president, I'll be the secretary. So that's the, you know, that is the mythological foundation story, is they're sort of teasing each other on the platform, except it turns out with each successive president to become more and more and more real. So Eisenhower in 1957 adds, through an act of Congress, adds office space and an allowance and mailing privileges to the former president. Lyndon Johnson grants them secret security, secret service security details and the use of presidential helicopters and even a projectionist from the White House Film Library if they were being treated at Walter Reed and wanted to watch movies from the White House Library. Uh, Richard Nixon adds the clubhouse, as John mentioned, which uh, only one reporter in history has stepped foot inside of. And when I asked the White House if I could actually see the clubhouse, which is on Jackson Square, right across the street from the White House, I called up the press secretary, Jay Carney, who used to be my colleague at Time, and he said, what building? <laughs> I don't think we know anything about this. In 1969, Richard Nixon is president, and he's getting calls constantly from the hill country of Texas, where uh, a suddenly exiled Lyndon Johnson is going crazy. He's been sent home, right? He's, his, his term is done. He decides not to run for re-election, and he's a little stir-crazy. He doesn't have much to do. He's been drinking from a fire hose for 10 years, longer than that, and he's constantly calling the White House saying, I want to come up. I want to do stuff. I, wanna, I need a plane. I need, a, I need a, somewhere to stay. And the, Johnson was driving the Nixon White House so to such distraction that Nixon finally said, just get him a house, get him a building, get him an office, get him a place to stay overnight. And a young military aide whose name, who was a colonel in the Air Force at the time, his, was named Brent Scowcroft, got this assignment. <laughs> and I guess that tells you how I found out about this story. Um, and uh, so they basically take over a, a rundown townhouse on Lafayette Square, uh, and it becomes this sort of this secret you know, uh, place where presidents can be work, stay overnight for the next, well, till today. Um, it has recently been renovated. I did recently get inside. Um, it's four stories. It's very nice. It's like the nicest four seasons you have ever stayed in your life. You can't check in, though. Only four people can do that. Um, and I just should tell you that the, the thread count on the sheets, it's like a gajillion. Um, and there's a lovely little seal on the, on, the, on the duvet cover where if you wake up in the morning and you're not sure what your old job was, you can kind of look down at your toes and go, oh. I used to be president of the United States. Uh, this is what, one of my favorite stories from the club. Um, you know, we all read, love reading presidential biographies. We read David McCulloch on Truman, and we read Robert Caro on LBJ, and uh, there are lots of great Reagan biographies, and they're fun to read, and, and, and they're a treasure to sort of sit down and curl up with. But one of the things we wanted to do in this book was to pull the two men up together, to look at relationships, because relationships are what are really interesting. And we, one of the things we discovered by working with the Reagan Library and some other archives was that these two men were friends and allies long before Reagan was president and long after Ike was. So much so that in 1965 and 66, when Ronald Reagan is just beginning his career as an elected official running for governor of California and then immediately thinking about the presidency once he is elected governor of California, Eisenhower in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is watching him. He's never met him. He's reading everything he can. He's watching him when he's on television. He's really intrigued by Reagan. Uh, he likes the optimism. Um, and he secretly begins to write letters to some of Reagan's friends to help him cope with the charge, which in those days was that Reagan was too much of an extremist to ever really represent the Republican Party. And Eisenhower's letters to Reagan through cutouts, through middlemen, are astonishing. They're like, if, for example, he, he was, he, there was a charge that he had been too close to the John Birch Society in the, in the early 1960s. It was a spurious charge, but it kept coming up. And Eisenhower scripts whole press conferences for Reagan to have. We should find someone to ask this question, and then Reagan should answer it this way. And he goes through several different iterations of this, through several letters, and he's doing it while Dick Nixon is trying to seek the GOP nomination. So you have the very interesting prospect of Eisenhower secretly helping Reagan in 66, 67, 68, while uh, Reagan is contesting for the GOP nomination against Richard Nixon, who used to be Ike's vice president. And whose daughter is about to start dating and will marry Ike's grandson just 
so that you have the full Gothic familial tableau. Can you, can you talk about this picture? Because you understand it better. So this is the Bohemian Grove. The, this is the, the club picnic. This is the club, the club picnic. Now, this is the, now you talk about this picture, because the, the, the thing that amazes us about what happens is how many of these relationships go back long, long, long before anyone is in politics. We're not quite sure who the man in the center is. Does anyone know? We were stumped by that, too. This is the Bohemian Grove in the summer of 1967, 68, I guess. Um, Richard Nixon on the left would meet Herbert Hoover at the, at, at the Grove. Uh, that summer, um, Nixon was giving the big speech uh, there about Hoover. Um, but what he really went to do was to meet with Reagan, because Reagan by now is actively seeking the 1968 uh, nomination. He's beginning to contest some primaries. He's beginning to pick up delegates. He's got the right wing of the Re Republican Party completely won over. He's got people like William F. Buckley saying, there's no one else to vote for in 1968 except Ronald Reagan. And here is Dick Nixon, who thought he would have a stately walk to the nomination, suddenly having to contend with this newcomer from California, who he had met just to go back, in 1947, when he was a young congressman. So they've known each other for a long time. They had corresponded through much of the early 1960s. But by this time, they're on opposite sides. And it's just, it's, as we found throughout this story, these men would be friends, sometimes rivals, long before either of them reach, reached the Oval Office. And this is a picture uh, that most people probably can't, can't time, but it's, um, while right after Nixon had um, sort of made his comeback after Watergate, Reagan is president. Um, uh, and there's a great story between the two of them. When Nixon becomes president, he goes to see Ike at Walter Reed. And Ike is not well. Uh, and the old soldier says to Nixon, uh, as he's giving him advice before he leaves, he says, I'm yours to command. And so when Reagan becomes president in 1981, in a long, 10-page, um, single-spaced letter, uh, which R Nixon would write to Reagan with all kinds of advice about who to appoint and how to conduct your first year, um, he would say, I'm yours to command, just as I had said to him. And you know, so we have these uh, partnerships, which, as with Reagan and Nixon, we often found <coughs> that uh, presidents of the same party often have a more complicated time getting along with each other than mm -hmm. presidents of different parties. And we see this up to this day. So with uh, President Obama and President Clinton, obviously their relationship uh, got off to something of a rocky start. Um, the 2008 campaign was bound to be a little hard on them. Uh, but the thing I think that got to Clinton most maybe was the fact that during that campaign, many of you will remember, that when Obama was e invoking a model of presidential greatness and vision, <coughs> it was not the last Democrat to manage to win two terms in the White House. It was the last Republican. <laughs> it was Ronald Reagan, who, who was the example Obama sought of someone who had set a clear vision for the country. It wasn't a vision that Obama agreed with, but what he was captivated by and what he honored was the fact that Reagan knew where he wanted to take the country and had been able to bring the country along with him. And of course, this was exquisitely calculated to drive Bill Clinton nuts. Um, and, and Obama would talk about the Clinton presidency in comparison implicitly to Reagan's as having been small and paltry and a missed opportunity and about small things. And so that guaranteed that this was not a relationship that was going to get off to a great start. And actually, after Obama wins and appoints Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State, he basically makes Bill Clinton sign a prenup. But, <laughs> All of the, you know, what money he is and is not allowed to raise and where he is and is not allowed to give speeches and what he can and cannot do and who he can and cannot see. And, and Clinton goes along with it. Um, he says, you know, it's Hillary's turn now and I'll do whatever they need me to do. But it really takes a while for these two men to find their footing at all. And I think one of the things, of course, that happens, and we see it happen to many presidents, is once President Obama has been in office for a while, he realizes that doing great big things is not easy. Doing anything is not easy. And suddenly the, the deals and the compromises and the maneuvers and things that they that, you know, had dismissed as Clintonian and that was not a compliment, suddenly 
were looking a lot more understandable. And so we saw, so, and now we see, so now we see in the newest Obama campaign video, which is directed by an Oscar winning director and narrated by an Oscar winning actor, Tom Hanks, stars appearing four times in 17 minutes, Bill Clinton. I, I, we've just come through a Republican primary, you know, where a lot of different people running for president, we talked about this earlier today, said, I know, <clears throat> were asked what they would do if they had become president, and they said, I would do what Ronald Reagan did. But what we forget is that the 2008 campaign on the Democratic side was a very big argument about Ronald Reagan, in which, as Nancy was hinting, uh, Obama basically said, I'll be more Reagan-esque than Clinton ever was. An astonishing thing to happen on a Democratic campaign, just so to say. The second big role they have as, in the club is consolation. Uh, these are men who come out of the office with huge scars, big welts, even when they're very successful. The thing that binds men from different parties and different generations in the club after it's all over, that makes them friends when you'd least suspect it, is that they all come out of office with welts and, and burdens and regrets uh, and things they wish they could do over. There are no easy decisions as president, um, and even the ones that turn out well, there are, they have misgivings about. This is a famous picture from 1961, right? Um, this is John F. Kennedy's first trip to Camp David, the place named after Ike's grandson, of course. Um, Ike gave him his tour there, but the, it was not a cordial call. It was, this was how many days after the Bay of Pigs? About five days. Five days the after the Bay after. of Pigs. Um, and uh, literally, uh, Eisenhower is taking Kennedy to the woodshed. When Kennedy had come into office, uh, he had reorganized the White House around his own way of making decisions. He thought that Eisenhower's very military hierarchy was not going to work. He wanted a much more personal kind of presidency. And then they had the Bay of Pigs, and he thought, well, maybe that's not working so well. Uh, uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy meet. This was a bark off, serious, you know, I tried to warn you, you can't organize the White House this way kind of talk. Uh, Kennedy said, uh, yeah, I'm beginning to figure that out now. And Kennedy would learn. He would, re he would change the way he did his decision making. Um, and it would become much more like uh, the one that I, interestingly enough, after they appear before the cameras, and Kennedy really needed this picture as much as he needed the talking to. He needed this picture because it conveyed a sense of, of authority and command to have the old general there. But Eisenhower didn't criticize Kennedy in public. In fact, the following week, a whole congressional delegation of Republican leaders in Congress came, made a pilgrimage to Gettysburg to see Eisenhower loaded for bear. You know, they thought, okay, the bloom is off the rose of Kennedy administration now, and Eisenhower brushed them back, said there should be no witch hunts. It is important that, that we support our president, that especially in foreign policy, especially in dangerous times, this not become a partisan issue. Um, Which is very much like what happened about two or three weeks ago. I just have to bring this up. After, after George W. Bush left office, instead of how the club has its protocols and traditions, he really went off the grid. He disappeared. Um, and he said, the current president deserves my silence, which is a very classy thing to do. Obviously, his vice president didn't take that approach. <laughs> um, but when he finally broke cover about three weeks ago and he made some very gently constructive criticism of Obama's tax and energy policy, after a sentence or two, he said, but I don't believe our president, our country should criticize our president. So the, the public role of presidents supporting uh, the current ones continues. This is just a great picture. So this is an amazing uh, moment, another amazing pairing. And again, another, you know, yes, two Texans, although we argue about whether Eisenhower counts as a Texan, but um, two men who had worked very closely together while Eisenhower is president and Johnson is majority leader, but still, you know, a, a true Republican, a true Democrat. Uh, the night of Kennedy's assassination, Johnson is on the phone to Eisenhower. And he says, you know, I've needed you for a long time. I need you more than ever now. The next morning, Eisenhower gets in his car, drives from Gettysburg to the White House to see, see Johnson. He sees Kennedy's body lying in state. Then he goes to see Johnson. And he writes out in longhand on a legal pad, here's what you need to call a joint session of Congress, and here's what you need to say. Because the world is watching. The country is traumatized. Everyone wonders what's going to happen next. And his basic advice is you need to promise to do everything in your power to push through Kennedy's agenda. Kennedy's agenda, which at that point was stalled in Congress and wasn't going anywhere, Eisenhower is advising Johnson to promise to push it through. And this is not because Eisenhower liked Kennedy's agenda. 
This is because Eisenhower believed that at this moment, what the country needed was a message of stability and of continuity. And throughout Johnson's presidency, Eisenhower plays this extraordinary off-camera role where Johnson will call him up and say, can you make up some cover story for why you need to be in Washington so that you can come and see me? Because I don't know, want everyone to think it's an emergency, so just come up with some other reason why you need to be here. But I really need to talk to you. To the point that there are, there are meetings that in the White House about Vietnam that Eisenhower ran. And you know, Johnson like attended, but Eisenhower ran the meeting. It was extraordinary. And at one point, Johnson says to him, you know, you're the best chief of staff I've got. It's really amazing. That, that relationship is very interesting. And my favorite detail from that is Johnson um, uh, actually once was so obsessed with Ike that he had his staff uh, find out every time he'd ever met him, attended a reception with him, just so he could sort of have physical evidence of a relationship with the man who went, then was the master. Uh, this is a, from a chapter I call Three Men in a Funeral which is when uh, Reagan sent these three guys to the uh, uh, funeral of uh, Anwar Sadat, October 1981, um, on uh, a version of the plane just like the one in the other room, uh, one prior uh, aircraft before that, 26,000, 26, I think. Um, none of these guys didn't like each other. Uh, there was not a lot of love lost between either of them, um, and uh, you can understand why. But on the way back, Nixon peels off on his own secret mission, naturally. And uh, <clears throat> Carter and Ford, who fought like ferrets in 1976, are, are now alone on the plane. Nixon is gone. Haig is gone. Uh, and Kissinger is gone. It's a weird plane load. And, um, <laughs> and they become friends. They realize they have something in common. They, they need, both need to raise money uh, on their libraries. Uh, they realize that they are both sort of men of faith. They both realized that they were tossed out of office a little bit before they would have liked. Um, and I think they looked around at the club and they saw Nixon and they knew Reagan was president um, and they thought, uh, you know, we might be stronger together than we are apart. Uh, and so over the next 25 years, Ford and Carter, again, across party, do 24 or 25 different projects on budgets, on deficits, on arms control, on Middle East politics. They've joined forces. They wrote a book together. They went overseas about 15 times together. They would promise by 1985 to give the eulogy of the other depending on who died first, which is really a, a measure of friendship. And, and so when Ford did pass in 2006, there were Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter in the front row in tears men who had fought very heavily in 1976. The club isn't, is like any fraternity, but the bonds are really special. Do you want to take this one? So uh, you call this a Beauty and the Beast slide. It, it's, more like the, it's more like the buddy movie Hollywood can never make. So you know, when Clinton takes office uh, after the 1992 election, something happens that had only happened once before in American history which was with Lincoln's inauguration, there were five living former presidents. And they all want his attention in varying degrees or another, but no one more so than Richard Nixon. And he is practically you know, standing outside the White House, jumping up and down, saying, listen to me, listen to me. And he, you know, he writes, uh, he's calling and calling and wanting Clinton to talk to him, and the calls aren't coming back. And so he writes a very friendly op-ed about the great promise of the Clinton presidency. There's no word. Now he, then he writes, a somewhat tougher op-ed, and he privately sends the signal, either you take my calls or these columns are going to be getting tougher and tougher. So finally, He's bad copying the, United, the president of the United States. <laughs> so fi finally, you know, Clinton calls him and, and of course realizes, as some of his predecessors too had, that, that you know, Nixon is still incredibly shrewd about the world. He has an extraordinary sense, like the chess master, of of what was going on in the former Soviet Union, what was going on in China. But Clinton, as he, they become late night phone buddies, uh, it isn't just to talk about foreign policy. It, he wants to talk to Nixon about how to organize his day, how to use his time. He runs through his schedule. You know, this is what I'm getting up in the morning. This is what I'm eating. This is what I'm doing. And of course, a president's time is the most scarce and precious thing that he has. And he wanted to know if he was using it well, which in the first months of the Clinton presidency, he certainly was not. It was kind of a mess. And, and so he was calling Nixon to say, how do I do this? Which Nixon loved, not only because he sort of liked being back in the game, but he sort of like, okay, 20 odd years later, it's, you know, this is still an impossible challenge. And when we went and interviewed Clinton about this, 
he said that one of his most prized possessions of being president was a letter that Nixon had sent him, <coughs> excuse me, a month before Nixon dies in March 1994. Nixon had just gone to Russia. Russia was undergoing huge change. He'd gone with Clinton's okay. In fact, he'd gone with Clinton's instructions. There are many foreign trips that, on this book of secret missions. This was one of them. And at the end of the trip, Nixon writes Clinton a long seven-page single-space letter. It's never been released. Pieces have been released. But we asked Clinton if we could have it and could we see it, and he said no. But, but, but he said that he told something that was in, way, in some ways better. He said, but I, 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 it's an amazing letter. It's hard-headed. It's smart. And we said, how do you, how do you, how, and he quoted something from it. And I said, how do you know? And he said, oh, I reread it every year. And when Nixon died in 1994, um, and it was, Clinton, it was the Clinton White House that announced the death, and Clinton, of course, gave the eulogy. He said a few weeks later that he missed him in the same way that he missed his mother. Uh, similar, not the same, similar, because he says, I often found myself wishing that I could pick up the phone and call him and ask him for advice. Now, it was a truly extraordinary thing that we got to witness a father and son in the White House. You know, what are the chances of that? And, and if, if politics is complicated, family is really complicated. Um, and, and yet, the only thing more extraordinary than the fact that President George Herbert Walker Bush got to see his son elected president is that he actually serves as the father or surrogate father of more than one president. What we found really incredible is the, the buddy movie of all time, is the friendship that developed, again, cross-party, cross-generation, uh, between President Clinton and the entire Bush family to the point that they now have a nickname for him. They call him their brother from another mother. <laughs> but I want to go back to this one because we get asked about this a lot. The, uh, when the two men finally meet in the Oval Office, remember this is the first father and son pairing of presidents since uh, the early 19th century. Both men are overcome. They can't speak. It's just too, this is later in the day, obviously. But it was quite an emotional moment. Um, a lot of people have asked us, you know, so did how much did uh, Bush two listen to Bush one? Um, how much did he ignore Bush one's advice? And I and I we always say, and the, the reporting bears this out as much as maybe people's uh, uh, wishes w were that it not true, um, is that the uh, in some ways the son was the comforter to the father. Uh, that all through the Gulf War, which was a very difficult time for the, uh, the president, um, uh, it, was, it was the younger man who would call the father up and say, um, turn off the television. You know, you got to stop watching this stuff. He, he, the older man was concerned about the criticism, just as any father would be of his son. And I, I think what 41 decided early on was that his son had a lot of advisors, um, but he really only had one dad. And so that would be the role that he would play, which is a, probably the choice most, I think, fathers would make. Anyway, easily under, misunderstood, but really simple when you think about it. Um, there is, this is not all kumbaya. I don't know what the opposite of kumbaya is, but we have a lot of that in this book. Um, and this is uh, one of the earliest. So again, you know, these relationships tend to follow often a twisting path. So if you look at Eisenhower and Truman, two men, architects, in a way, of, of the post-war world. They worked very closely and effectively together as they're trying to figure out America's role as, as the a surviving superpower, the idea of permanently stationing American troops in Europe and then selling uh, a reluctant American public in Congress on the idea of NATO. Truman understood it would take someone of Eisenhower's stature to, to get this idea to be accepted. And so the, they were so effective as partners through those years uh, immediately following the war that in 1948, Truman even says to Eisenhower, you know, if you're thinking about running, I'll get out of the way. I won't only get out of the way, I'll be your vice president if you want. So you have these men who start out with very warm relations who by the time in 1952 Eisenhower does run for president, it all comes apart and it comes apart badly. And it comes apart mainly over the fact that Truman concluded that Eisenhower was failing to stand up to and challenge the most extreme elements in his party, and especially Senator McCarthy. And Truman was furious about this. He called Eisenhower a moral coward, and he started campaigning across the country, saying Eisenhower was unfit for the office, that anyone who would not stand up to McCarthy did not deserve to be President of the United States. 
So therefore, no surprise maybe that on Inauguration Day, Eisenhower was still so angry, he initially refused to come to the White House to pick up Truman to go to the inauguration. They barely spoke throughout Eisenhower's presidency. Um, Truman does not step foot back in the White House. But these relationships, again, it, it's never that simple. And the two men do find themselves again together, mainly at funerals, particularly in November of 1963, when they share a limousine back from Arlington Cemetery, the burial of President Kennedy. And they start talking about their own burial plans. And in that sort of shadow of their mortality, small things fall away, the big things come back. Truman turns to Eisenhower and says, you wanna come in for a drink? And they end up back at Blair House talking and reconciling. And so a friendship that turns into a feud turns back into a reconciliation because ultimately what they both had been through by this time, what they both knew as presidents was much more important than the fights that they had had. That story had a happy ending. This one, not so much, but you have to tell this. Well, you know, I don't know that there have ever been two political combatants more skilled and um, fighting for stakes as high as Richard Nixon and Lyndon Johnson. And the remarkable thing, you remember that in the 1968 election, uh, Johnson had decided not to run for another term. All he wanted was to redeem his presidency, leave office as a peacemaker. He was determined that there should be some kind of a breakthrough. Richard Nixon, of course, had his own reasons for worrying that if there were a breakthrough in Vietnam, that he did not stand a very good chance of winning that election. Very shortly before election day in 1968, Johnson discovers that Richard Nixon's allies had been secretly sabotaging the peace talks. He calls this treason privately. What does he do about it? This is 1968. We've seen Bobby Kennedy assassinated. We'd seen Martin Luther King assassinated. We'd seen the Democratic Convention turn into a war zone. And I think part of Johnson's calculation was what it would do to the country to have an outgoing president accuse a major party candidate of sabotaging uh, peace negotiations at the most delicate moment. But it was an extraordinary moment of confrontation. And ultimately, Johnson decides not to challenge Nixon about it. And that election, you remember, was very, very close. Four years later, uh, you understand now all the reasons that Nixon had to keep Johnson very happy. It was Johnson during the transition that showed Nixon where the tape recorders were in the White House. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I think Nixon got the clubhouse, why he orchestrated Johnson's birthday party, why he sent a jet down to the ranch with briefing papers every week. He really wanted to keep Johnson in the tent. The Ladybird Grove. Ladybird Grove. They created a special forest in California for Ladybird just to pay, pay homage to Johnson. Uh, so Nixon's reelected in the landslide. Watergate is now gaining force. And in January of 1973, uh, Nixon's men call Johnson and say, you know, you might want to call your friends in the Senate and just tell them to back off on this Watergate investigation or else, you know, we'll reveal the fact that you were illegally sub surveilling, eavesdropping on us back in 1968. To which Johnson said, well, if you do that, I'll say what I learned when I was illegally <laughs> wiretapping you back in 1968. You have, I mean, you have this extraordinary moment of sort of mutual blackmail and you think, well, how is it that this didn't all just blow up? Well, the reason it didn't all blow up was about two weeks later, Nixon is inaugurated for his second term and two days after that, Lyndon Johnson died of a heart attack. And at that moment, that rather perilous moment in the history of the American presidency, there was no club. Harry Truman had died at Christmas. Johnson died in January. Nixon is all alone. This picture really tells you all you need to know about how George w. Herbert Walker Bush is feeling. <laughs> um, not every president gets along with members of the other party. Uh, Jimmy Carter has been a challenge for all of them. Um, I think it's partly because it's in Carter's nature to be sort of a uh, my way or the highway kind of guy. Um, he's also had another challenge. He, was, uh, he left office at the age of 56 or 57. In September, Jimmy Carter becomes the longest living ex-president in American history. 31 years. 
Hang on. 31 years, 8 months, 24 days, surpassing Herbert Hoover's record. Um, that's not an easy burden to bear. Uh, Carter has worked very hard at his second career. He's really invented the modern post-presidency. When he got out of office, he was depressed for a year. He wasn't sure what to do. He was confused about it. He thought, I have a long life. This is going to be hard. Uh, but he, he writes some books. He starts doing uh, charitable stuff. You know, he has done huge amounts of things he, at home and overseas in the last 31 years and eight months. He won the Nobel Prize. But he also has a way of, and all the presidents have turned to him, except uh, I think Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama have all sent him on foreign missions of some kind. Um, and he has normally delivered the goods, but he has a tendency to go off script. Um, this was a kind of classic moment. It's at the funeral of Coretta Scott King in about 2005, 2006. I'm not sure when. Um, it was a moment really to pay homage uh, to a civil rights leader. Um, Carter used it as a chance to very gently criticize uh, the other man's son, who was then president. Carter has a way of saying things like this. Uh, I feel that my role as a former president is probably superior to that of other presidents. You know, every club needs a black sheep. <laughs> gives, some, gives everyone else in the club something to, you know, unite around. Clinton would also send Carter overseas, um, but even when he did it uh, the first and second time, he wasn't sure that he wanted it was going to all turn out okay. I just love that quote. I'm sending Carter. He said this to George Stephanopoulos. You think it will be okay, don't you? The last thing we want to talk about here is how they, the club really works to unite, uh, unites when the, when the presidency is in crisis. The presidency is more important than any president. They all recognize that in our politics today, uh, which don't work very well, that one thing that has to work, one thing that always has to be functioning and powerful and effective uh, is the presidency. And this is, this is where we see them most willing to put self-interest, put party interest, put political interest aside. And join together, make common cause around some larger purpose. We see it with Truman and Hoover again, where of all people to completely reorganize the executive branch, why on earth would Truman sign off on Herbert Hoover chairing what became known as the Hoover Commission? This is a guy who everyone assumed was just going to dismantle the entire New Deal superstructure of government. What Truman knew by this time about Hoover was Hoover had been president in a moment of national crisis, and he knew that a president needs the tools to be able to meet a crisis. And especially in the post-war nuclear age, having those tools was more important than ever. Mm -hmm. And Truman trusted Hoover to do a reorganization of the executive that would empower the presidents who followed. It was essentially the great gift that they both gave to all the presidents who followed to organize and rationalize the executive branch in a way that presidents would be able to function better. And the fact that, that Hoover strengthened the presidency at a moment that it was occupied by a Democrat made no difference. In fact, in the course of gathering the information for the Hoover Commission, Hoover found out so much that was wrong and wasteful in government that if he had let any of it be known during the 1948 election, it's very easy to imagine. Reporters at the time later said, it's amazing that Hoover didn't leak any of this. He kept it to himself because his larger goal was to make sure that the presidency itself was strengthened for all the presidents who followed. Something we see across party uh, all the time. Uh, we see it again <laughs> yeah, when Hoover and Eisenhower advised Richard Nixon not to challenge the results in 1960. As close as that race was, as many accusations as there were of some funny business, in phone calls within 15 minutes of each other, Eisenhower and Hoover both say to Nixon, uh, it would not be good for the country. You stand down. It would be, and it would be seen overseas as? We needed a much smoother, the smooth, peaceful transition of power was an essential model that America represented around the world. And this was not a time to be having a prolonged battle over it. Uh, this is the pardon uh, for just a, a fact that we hadn't really talked about Gerald Ford very much, though he plays a role at a number of points of trying to protect the presidency, uh, both, I think, in his pardon of Nixon, which he realized his presidency simply could not begin until that matter was taken off the table. Later, he would come uh, try to rescue Bill Clinton from uh, impeachment in 1998. Uh, privately working behind the scenes in a series of phone calls to try to get Clinton simply to admit that he lied and work toward a censure and away from impeachment. In the end, he couldn't convince Clinton of that, 
but he worked really hard uh, to try to make that happen. Uh, this is the famous meeting in Century City. Most people don't know that these two men actually ever met. As far as I can tell, they have met twice. First in 1983, when uh, President Reagan invited all the governors to the White House, and so both uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, there's a picture of them with, uh, uh, is that, am I right? That's the only other time, right? This is not the place to make a mistake about that. <laughs> Um, that picture exists, and this is the other picture which uh, we, we only found lately in the Time Life archives. Um, it's a great story. Uh, Century Plaza, uh, I would say late November 1992. Uh, Bill Clinton is in his post-election pre-inauguration tour. Um, he pays a courtesy call on Ronald Reagan. Um, they have a brief and polite conversation about things that every president or would-be president agree on, like line item veto and the need for tighter budgets, and at one point Clinton asks the question, any other advice for me? And, and President Reagan says, well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get to Camp David. You've got to get out of that building. It's just a, you know, it's, it's good for the soul to get out into the mountains. And it was advice that Clinton didn't really take um, until he realized a year or two into his presidency that he needed to get out of the house. Um, the other thing is that President Reagan had been watching President Clinton during the campaign and found his salutes a little wimpy, as John was too kind to say, but it, it, was, it was not a sharp, crisp salute. And of course, President Reagan had been in the military. Um, he had also uh, played many roles uh, of, uh, in the, of military officers. And, and, and Car Clinton, as I understand it, then asked Reagan to show him how to do it. And so the two men actually had a brief saluting clinic there in the uh, Century Plaza offices of the president. Um, and it reminded me that it was Eisenhower who taught Kennedy how to press a couple of buttons on the phone and make a quick getaway by helicopter. And it was Johnson who taught Nixon where the tapes were, although that may have, Johnson may have had a scheme up his <laughs> sleeve about that. And it's not just in matters of policy that the, the men who are commanders in chief pass on tips. Um, this was one uh, where a, a former president had a particularly keen understanding of the role that public perception plays in leadership, not just of our public officials, but our private ones. It's very important. Um, and Clinton would learn that, and he would come to salute every time he got off the helicopter, just as President Reagan had done. And it was passed on further when I think George W. Bush went to visit Clinton, uh, when President Clinton was leaving office, and George W. Bush asked Clinton he said to him, you know, you didn't used to be such a great speaker, because Clinton had given a horrible speech one time at, I would say, the 1988 Democratic Convention. And he said, do you have any tips about how to give a good speech? So the President's Club functions on levels both high, you know, and sometimes just very practical. But ultimately, I think what struck us is the, the ultimate of all the, the rules and the rituals and the feast days and the souvenirs and the clubhouse itself, the thing that makes the club most real um, is this notion that the office itself is more important than the individuals and who occupy it. And we kept hearing this again and again and again, particularly when one administration gives way to another. So in January of 2009, President Bush summoned the entire club membership to the White House to meet the new guy. And, and he says at that time to President Obama, look, we all want you to succeed. And those of us who have been in this office know the office transcends the individual. And I think what Michael and I took away from all of this research was seeing how these are, these are men, they're fiercely ambitious. They've played immense roles in our country's history. They all are haunted by how history will remember them. They have very deep, strong, wide, broad agendas themselves. And yet over and over and over again, we also saw them set those agendas aside or move past them or find in their own interest a larger interest that brought them together and brought them together to do great and important things, or to do the small but still highly important work of just helping each other, because it is a very hard job. It's not a job they can complain about. It's not something they can whine about. They all fought, in many cases, much of their lives to get the job. But once they do it, there's, this, there's something that comes up again and again, where Jefferson called it you know, a splendid misery. Uh, Buchanan called the presidency a crown of thorns. Truman used to refer to the great white jail that is the White House. Uh, it is also a very difficult job. 
And even the ones who do it successfully can be wounded by it and bear burdens from having done it. And there are very few people they can talk to about it. And so the one thing that they want one another to know is basically, yeah, I get it. You can call me. I understand. I get it. I know how hard it is. And I won't give you a hard time. And that's what we saw here, and it's what we saw all through history. And I think it is, is a model, maybe, that many of us can take back with us in whatever realm we are operating. So thank you very much. We, we'd be happy to take your questions. Um, Nancy and Michael have been gracious enough to uh, allow a few minutes at the end here for some questions. And so all I ask is if you have a question, if you could raise your hand. We have people in the aisles that have a microphone. And just wait till the microphone gets in your hand, and we'll uh, start right over here. Is there such a situation with the first ladies, like the president? Uh, it's so interesting how uh, we, we've, a lot of people have been curious about that. And what I think we all have seen is that first ladies are especially aware if you are trying to raise children in the White House. And it seems to be mainly girls. Um, Lately. That, Lately, it has been, you know, that there were the Johnson girls and the Nixon girls and Amy Carter and Chelsea Clinton and the Bush girls and now the Obama girls. And so uh, as the mother of girls, it's, it's a wonderful, glorious challenge in any event. Trying to do it in the bright white lights of the White House would be especially challenging. And so, you know, Hillary Clinton has talked about how helpful Jackie Kennedy was to her about raising children in the spotlight. Uh, Lucy Johnson told us that there's, there's a reason why first families don't criticize each other. That she says, it's not that we're all such wonderful people. It's that, but it's that we understand how difficult it is. So there is, I think there is something of a kinship among the first families. Uh, there's a marvelous picture that we saw up here in the, in the library of um, six first ladies together. Um, and certainly, I think there is a bond between them because they too are having a very unique experience. Having said that, uh, the, the semi-official infrastructure of the President's Club um, is, is unique to Presidents. Uh, I suspect it will not be long before it is no longer an all-male club. But uh, for the time being, we haven't seen any, any equivalent uh, outside of the Presidents themselves. That be? I think there's another question here. Sixteen, seventeen-year-old Bill Clinton shaking the hand of uh, President Kennedy, even though it was only for a second, probably. It, it, is there any evidence that uh, Bill Clinton met Lyndon Johnson? Uh, he would have been a college student around that time. Uh, but is there are there any photographs? Uh, we asked Clinton this because uh, I suspected that if he had had a chance, he would have. Um, <laughs> And in, in fact, in his office, uh, in President Clinton's office, is a signed picture from Lyndon Johnson that had to be 40 a, years old. There's a story. The story is great. You know, he just, uh, Clinton just reviewed the Robert Cairo book in the New York Times on Sunday, which we thought was an excellent club idea, and we supported it as club authors. We thought that was good. Um, uh, in 1972, Clinton is tapped by George McGovern to run Texas for McGovern, which as lost causes go, <laughs> is one of the great lost causes. <laughs> Texans for McGovern. <laughs> Hopeless. Who was the only ally they thought they had, the people running Texas for McGovern? Lyndon Johnson, except that he wasn't sure he was really for McGovern either. So the day comes when McGovern and then Tom Eagleton go to the ranch, right after the convention, but before they realize Eagleton not, might not be the best vice presidential candidate. Um, Bill Clinton, the co-chairman of Texans for McGovern, and his uh, coach, uh, Taylor Branch, who would eventually be Clinton's diarist, kind of, sort of, uh, have to flip a coin about which one of them accompanies McGovern and Eagleton to the ranch to see Johnson. Clinton loses the coin, co the coin toss. And so Taylor brings back from the meeting, which did not go well, by the way, uh, a signed picture uh, for Clinton of LBJ. So that's as close as Clinton got to meeting 
LBJ. But what's great about the American presidency is we all remember when or if we saw, even if it's a motorcade going by our first president. And so Ronald Reagan remembered that he saw um, FDR from at the, on the back of a train somewhere in Iowa. I think it was Des Moines. I'm pulling that, but it's, I wouldn't count on it. So, and, and he was at a Truman event, as I mentioned before. So everyone has their sort of creation stories, but uh, Clinton never met LBJ. He told us he thought, as all presidents do of their successors, he said, history will be kinder to him. <laughs> so that's, that's what they all hope for. Uh, right over here. So the implications of the President's Club is that's unique to the American democracy. Are there similar models um, in Europe with other democracies, prime ministers of Britain? Can I answer this? Yeah. I, I think what's amazing about the President's Club in America, well, let me answer it this way. I read a story in the New York Times yesterday about how you know, it, it was inevitable that um, Sarkozy would be defeated because he wasn't, a, he wasn't a, a typically French president. The French liked their presidents grandfatherly and cool and anti-American. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarkozy was none of those things. <laughs> he wasn't grandfatherly cool. What's, and that reminded me, when we go back to this picture, I mean, go back please. There's nothing in common about any of these guys. They're all different. It's a classic American story. We elect presidents who don't begin to fit in the same mold. And if you went back the following five, it would be just as different if you added Reagan and Nixon and Johnson and, and Kennedy. I mean, we, it, it, this club bespeaks our own makeup and our own um, widely different you know, backgrounds. And it's, it's an, a quintessentially American thing. And so I, I don't think there would, the clubs that you would have in France or, or England probably already existed. You wouldn't have to create them because they all came out of clubs. There's no, <laughs> there's no club that would have all these guys as a member in America. They're just too different. So that's what I think it's so remarkable about this is that, is that they've created their own. And that's, that too, creating your own association is, is a quintessentially American thing. So there. Well put. Well put. Oh, back here. When you were doing your research, did you have a chance to talk to all the living presidents and what was their take on your book? We, uh, we were able to talk to President Clinton and the first President Bush and President Carter. I had interviewed, as it happened, uh, the second President Bush um, before we were working on this book and just, you know, God smiling on us. I had happened to ask him about his view of his predecessors and how I was asking him club questions before I even knew there was a club. So, um, so we were very, very grateful for the help they were willing to give us. I think, though, you know, this is a pretty intimate group, and I'm, I think there are lots of things that they will not talk about, and I would even argue as a citizen that's as it should be. Um, so, um, but we were, I think we got a lot of help from them and from, from people who had served often multiple presidents and had a, had a chance to compare the way they function and who they rely on and when they reach out and how this little inner circle works. We have time for one last question. Back here. Are there security levels um, such that the, the present um, president cannot discuss certain levels of information with other presidents? Well, I think if you were going to uh, um, tell anyone outside the Titus circles that exist, a president, a former president would be among them. You know, George Herbert Walker Bush sent them monthly newsletters, kind of, but well, not monthly. He offered them secure phones, and interestingly, all but one turned them down. I think a lot of the people who used to be presidents kind of want to get away a little. They've had enough of that secure <laughs> world stuff, and I, don't, I gave that up for something better or different. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think there's a, um, a real downside to telling any of those guys that that happens. I, I think what's interesting is that when they tell, even after the strike on Osama bin Laden, the first two calls by President Obama were first to George Walker Bush and then to Bill Clinton, because I think he knew that these two men had both in their own way tried to get him and were impeded for different reasons, unable to make it happen or pull it off. And I think Obama was saying, or tipping his hat to the fact that this had been a shared mission over three presidencies. And it took all three to get it done. That's a more important kind of loop. Thank so you. We are about out of time. Uh, just on behalf of uh, everyone here, uh, the Reagan Library and the Foundation, uh, Mike and Nancy, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. It was just fascinating. Thank We're you. so happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you.